Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being here today. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and start with introductions. Um, can you guys hear us okay on Zoom today? Yep. Can, can hear you fine. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, if you're on the Zoom meeting, if you could please introduce yourself in the chat, that would be awesome. And uh, we'll start with you. All right. I'm Emily Curtis with Discover Your Forest. My name is Dan Galecki from Spindrift Forestry Consulting. Spindrift Forestry Consulting. <laughs> and, uh, I haven't participated in about two years, so I'm happy to be here. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. Greg Bryant with the Shoes River Woods. Good morning, Patty Gentle, I'm the Sun River Owners Association. Good morning, Robin Church, Three Pines HOA. I'm Diane Holmes with the Bridges at Shadow Glen HOA. I'm on the Firewise Committee. Good morning, I'm Bob Poley with the Mountain High HOA and I'm a steering committee member. Good morning, Dave Brittinger with Elkai Woods uh, HOA. Mary Ann Kramer with HOA at Elkai Woods. Carolyn Dahlberg with Tollgate um, and I'm on the Firewise Committee too. Good morning, everyone. Uh-oh. Sorry about that, guys. Something happened. We got booted out of here. Um, so we're just going to start with a couple updates. Um, like I was saying, fire freeze coming up. Uh, not landfill and bend is going to be May 6th through the 21st. And the transfer stations are going to be June 3rd through the 17th. And we also have a couple more dates that I've just added. Um, we're also going to be, uh, Sun River compost site is going to be holding it May 5th and the 6th. And in Jefferson County, Box Canyon Transfer Station is going to be May 13th, 14th, and 20th and 21st. Um, and then Kevin has some updates about the Oregon State Fire Marshal grant that we just received. Yeah, so um, Oregon State Fire Marshal um, uh, allocated $72,000 to us um, to kind of uh, ramp up our Firewise grant funding program. We had a grant funding program last fall um, using the lottery grant money that we get. It's discretionary funds that we get um, that's allocated through the commissioners. That was so successful that we're uh, going to try and use the same process essentially this spring. Um, so if you were familiar with that grant process that we had last fall, it'll be very similar. Um, again, it's $72,000. It'll be very similar to the, the lottery grant we did last fall. Um, the anticipated application period 
uh, will be March 23rd through April 7th. Um, so in a couple of days, we I kind of have everything in, in play. We're just trying to make sure the application's a little more streamlined this year. It's going to be a fillable form. Um, that way we can track people a little bit better. Um, and then the reporting date, this is, this is the big one, is uh, projects need to be completed and reported by August 30th. And so that's not a lot of time. I understand that. Um, but we do have this funding and we want to try and get it out to communities and you know get some defensible space on the ground. Um, I will be having a Q&A session, um, which will be part of the application process on March 30th at 1030. And so that will be um, in person at the County Road Department and on Zoom. And that's just, just for questions uh, that people have about the grant. Um, that, that's, you know, we don't have a lot of time during this meeting to really answer everything. So we're just gonna have a separate meeting for that if anyone has questions about that funding. Um, again, the, the, the projects will be very similar to what we were awarding last year with the lottery grant funding. So priority will go to Firewise communities or up and coming Firewise communities, folks that are uh, trying to become Firewise um, it always looks good if you have matching funds. So if there's funds that you have or, uh, you know, in kind or sweat equity, some kind of work that you're doing within your community that can match that funding, that always looks on the, good on the grant application. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all, pretty much all about that. Is there any questions right now with that grant funding? Yeah. yeah, that's great, Brian. And our question is, is that the same thing as what the commissioners have given, like $100,000 last year? It's just the same thing. The, the process will be pretty much the same, but the funding source will be different. Okay. So this year, this particular funding project will be from Oregon State Fire Marshals, where we received the funds, okay. where prior to that, it was discretionary funds. From okay. The now, do you know if the, if the commissioners are going to do anything again or not? I, we are anticipating they will. I, I think that program was such a success that I don't see why they wouldn't, but that's something that we have to wait to yeah. see because okay. they have to allocate right. that fund. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is the amount that you can uh, apply for? Uh, we don't have a set amount. We just have, we have a total amount. Um, I think generally, you know, projects within the thousand to five thousand dollars are kind of the, the average but you know we don't want to try and set it like a set amount that we can people will receive funding it's really going to be based on demand and, and what the projects are and, and anybody can qualify even if you've had a grant uh, yes 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 anyone could qualify again priority will go to firewise communities and up and coming firewise and uh do, do you have to match it is it a matching? Um, matching will definitely bring you up on the list as far as like priority of who can be fine. Yeah. Kevin, do we expect more funding to come in the future? Because it seems to me we we're putting in for something like 300,000 and now we got 72,000. So, the, uh, okay, yeah. That, this is a separate, this was actually money that we were awarded through Oregon State Fire Marshal. We have a grant that we award um, that was also through Oregon State Fire Marshal that was part of the 762 bill. That was the full, we applied for the full amount of 500,000. So that's completely separate from what I'm talking about. And that we're still waiting to hear about okay. that. Thank you. Yeah. So can you confirm the time is uh, 10.30 on March 30th? Yeah. March 30th at 1030 is what we have tentative. Um, once we put the announcement out, all that stuff will be yeah. So it appears that uh, this these grant opportunities are for general public or age grade. Can a municipality apply? Um, um, not for these funds. Okay. We gear them towards the community, like this the seven six two Oregon State Fire Marshal grant that you were talking about. That was a grant that all sorts of different organizations could have applied for, um, and we did have I think some municipalities apply. Yeah, the city of sisters always has their ears open. For yeah, types of things. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay. Any questions um, on Zoom? Okay. 
All right, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, um, and then one other thing, we are working on updating the Upper Shoes River CWPP. Um, we're gonna be having our second meeting for that on April 17th. I'm still currently looking for a location, so I don't have that set in stone yet, but um, we, might, we might do it somewhere down in the Pine or um, downtown over here in this building, I'm trying to figure that out still. Uh, if you are interested in being a part of that meeting, uh, just send me an email and I'll add you to my list. And so <clears throat> today we have a, I'm really excited about this uh, presentation. It's forest entomology, which is going to be uh, focusing on insects and bug dolls, stuff like that. Um, Christine Wolf, from, she's a forest entomologist. She'll be presenting from Oregon Department of Forestry. She's actually going to be presenting on Zoom. So she is ready. Can you hear yeah, us? Yeah, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, are you seeing this in full screen? No, not yet. Not yet. There we go. Okay. So we're seeing in presenter mode on our end. All right, let me. All right, how does that look? <clears throat> Good. Okay, great. Um, I'll go ahead and get started if that's okay. Yes, thank you. Great, Thanks thank for you. Being here. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, anytime there's an outreach opportunity, I always grab it um, because then it's more people to spread the information. So I really appreciate the invite. Um, so I'm Christine Buell and I'm forest entomologist with Oregon Department of Forestry. Our unit is the forest health unit that also includes a pathologist that looks at diseases, um, and then an invasive species specialist and aerial survey specialist. And I'll talk a little bit about aerial survey. It's something that we do every year as a, a long-term data collection effort. Um, but just as an introduction, our forest health unit is here for any sort of technical assistance and guidance, um, looking at insects, disease, abiotic issues on the forested landscape um, for any sort of client, public and private. Um, so I just want to introduce a little bit about my group. Um, as I go through this presentation, I'm um, going to try and leave as much time as possible for questions at the end. Um, and I definitely encourage you to leave questions in the chat as we go so you don't forget about them. Um, but often I like questions at the end so that um, I can hopefully answer some of those ahead of time as I'm going through um, and kind of get them all done at once. But I do encourage you to put them in the chat as well. Uh, all right, so what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about insects, underlying factors that predispose trees to insects and how that all intersects with wildfire as well as a few things that um, maybe you're not thinking about. So we're thinking more so about pests, um, pest insects in trees that have been damaged by wildfire, but I'm gonna kind of step outside of that zone and talk a little bit about some benefits of wildfire for insects as well, and some other common critters that you'll see out there. Um, I always like to start with insects as beneficials. Um, if we aren't already thinking about, about it that way, um, that we just think about insects as pests, I encourage you to first think about them as beneficials because the overwhelming amount of them are very beneficial. We do need them and want them on our landscape. They're the base of many food chains. Um, they're natural enemy pest control. You, you kind of forget that they're there working in the background until they're not there. And then you definitely notice that loss of pest control action from predators and parasitoids. Um, they're essential for decomposition, nutrient cycling. This is especially true for a forested system, especially for trees that are dead and dying, that we need something that can break that material down, uh, return those resources back to that ecosystem. And very few things can feed on wood because it's not very nutritious. Um, usually it's pretty dry or it's too wet. Um, really hard to digest, but we have these insects that are useful for breaking down that material. Um, and some of the insects that we'll talk about today are pests, um, but they also are selectively removing pest bit trees on our landscape. Um, and then we have a wide variety of pollinator services or um, um, 
other services, ecosystem services and insects are providing. And one of the things I will talk about are pollinators in our forested landscape, because we found a lot of evidence recently that, um, that forests host a great deal of pollinators. Okay, now jumping back into insects as pests. So I wanna make really clear, again, most of the time insects on our landscape is a good thing, um, but we do have some pests on our landscape um, in the forested system. Typically, they are secondary and opportunistic, meaning they are taking advantage of trees that are already stressed, their defenses are down. So there are some uh, key scenarios that leave our forests predisposed to insect problems. So one is cyclical outbreaks in Central Oregon. Um, you should be particularly aware of the periodic outbreaks of Pandora moth, that really large moth that looks a little bit pink and has big fat larvae um, feeding on pine trees. That's a periodical outbreak that just depending upon their biology or the conditions around them, um, they can outbreak. And um, as soon as their um, populations kind of explode, they overwhelm the defenses of trees and sometimes they can stress the trees in that way. But oftentimes with these insects that have periodic outbreaks, their populations will collapse on their own just as quickly as they arose. And so we don't tend to treat those um, because that's more work and um, resources than is really necessary when they will collapse on their own. So that's one type of um, high pest pressure scenario, but typically, as I mentioned, it will collapse on its own. A lack of natural controls is becoming an increasingly bigger problem as we have invasive species moving into the area or establishing, um, especially as our conditions become more favorable, especially to insects that are used to warmer climates. Um, and so having those invasive insects on the landscape is a problem because we do not have their co-evolved natural enemies to keep them in under check. And so um, we have things like predators and parasitoids that are less selective towards those pests. They aren't aware of them or they just can't prey on them at all. And so um, those invasive insects are allowed to kind of proliferate on our landscape. We also have issues such as pesticide drift or mild winters that don't beat back the insects um, and keep them at a lower level, uh, especially the mild winters as we've had warmer and warmer winters more pest insects, native and non-native, can survive into the spring, and so we have higher pest pressure, pressure issues. And this image is actually balsam, balsam woolly adelgid invasive from Europe that's been long established here, especially in our higher elevation true fur. Um, and that's just a pest that's kind of a pest of the site that spreads and spreads, uh, very difficult to control. The last one um, in Central Oregon you should also be particularly aware of is when we have a large number of stressed trees. Now, a well-defended tree um, or a healthy tree is a well-defended tree. Sap is the primary mode of defense. It's a chemical and mechanical barrier against insects and some diseases. Um, quite essential for these trees to thrive. And so they need water for that sap. If they don't have enough water, if they don't have their defenses, their stress, they also release stressful smells that insects such as bark beetles can, can detect and zero in on. And so a lot of the insects I'm going to talk about today are native, widely present on the landscape, not a problem under natural levels, population levels. However, when we have a whole bunch of uh, stressed food material for them to feed on, their populations explode into numbers that are so, un, uh, so large, they're not natural, that they will spill over from the stressed trees into some of the healthier trees and just overwhelm their defenses. So some of the stress factors that we see that cause widespread damage in trees in our landscape are drought. That's been an ongoing issue that I'll talk more about. A main predisposing factor to insect attack, uh, fire damage, storm damage, mechanical damage, anything which stresses the tree reduces the defenses. So we're probably aware of a lot of these factors that contribute stress to trees in our stand. So having the species or cultivar that's not suited to the microclimate of that site or the location, um, maybe it's poor or inappropriate site quality, thin soils, rocky soils, et cetera. Um, sometimes it's you know southerly exposure, uh, wind exposed, something that um, can possibly even contribute to drought stress factors. Um, competition, so overstocked stands or invasive species that are kind of out competing our trees for moisture, especially. 
And then just normal old age, low vigor. Um, every tree has an end of life period um, that makes them less uh, healthy and vigorous and defended. Uh, any sort of mechanical injury, compaction, or damage from um, the elements or prior insect or other animal damage um, or pathogen damage. Every little thing that can um, stress the tree builds up. And, and so the tree can get to a point where on their own, these individual stressors aren't problematic, but when layered on each other, um, it creates long-term stress for the tree. And at some point their defenses start weakening. So the best management practices overall for healthy trees, healthy stands, which then contribute to their resiliency against insects is not treating the insect itself, but treating that predisposed factor um, that's, or those factors that are predisposing trees to insect pests. So to avoid these factors, get ahead of it, um, select the species that's appropriate for the site and thinking forward to our changing climate, especially looking at how our climate has changed just in the past five, 10, 15 years. So utilizing things like a seed lot selection tool, possibly adjusting the placement of those genotypes a little bit. I'm not talking about full species migration, um, but just adjusting those genotypes a little bit from um, drier sites. Um, and then establishing young trees well, treat them like human babies, um, give them a good start, give them a lot of moisture to establish well in the first few years, reduce any sort of competition for moisture that's um, really reducing the vigor of these trees and not fertilizing. Um, fertilizing doesn't just green trees back up. Uh, when they start fading, fertilization is not going to help. And especially in times of drought, we don't want to encourage fertilization because that increases growth, therefore water needs. You can apply some preventative insecticides. Most of the insecticides we have for our insect pests are only preventative. They don't work once the insect is in the tree and applying them judiciously. So whenever it actually makes the most sense, um, timing is important, but also the, the cost should really be weighed with um, potentially addressing some of the other factors on site. And then allowing natural enemy refugia. The predators and parasitoids that control our insects are essential. And so we need to leave some patches that are maybe skip zones for spraying, or um, we don't sanitize those areas or reduce all that material. They need some habitat to reside in. So as I mentioned, drought is a common precursor that's really important for um, the natural health of our trees. They need that moisture. And um, this is the last year of La Nina, which means in this region, a cooler, wetter winters. Um, and so uh, we did experience that, but on the 30 year average, it still was not what where we should be at for uh, temperature and precipitation. So pretty much statewide, we've been in a drought for multiple years. And you can see in this water year, image, um, the last image um, on the left was mean temperature where we're well above average for most of the state. And then um, we have well below average precipitation for uh, particularly east of the Cascades, the brown areas um, are well, well below normal precip. And then um, another figure just to show you um, how intense the drought has been across the state. Um, so we started out drier and then we got a bit more moisture but even still, the highest ranking is maroon. So you see a whole lot of it on the left, particularly in central Oregon, just east of the Cascades. And that continues on even in the end of the year where we typically receive more moisture. So um, seeing a lot of red on the map is definitely not a good thing. And this is a, a heat map from our aerial surveys. So we fly statewide aerial surveys across the entire forested regions of the state to um, record damage from insects, diseases, abiotic issues. It's a long-term data set that's to be taken on a watershed level. So it's a, a large scale um, view of what's happening on the landscape. And where you see the really light color, that white, that is the highest pest pressure or drought pressure or highest levels of damage. Typically it's um, drought with bark beetles added on, um, taking advantage of those drought stress trees. So you see, a lot of higher mortality rates that's in the white and the red, um, particularly in um, the central part of the state, um, just around the Cascades, we had a lot of uh, pest pressure um, because we had a lot of drought stress trees. And you may have heard about Fermageddon that was um, 
part of that data will, which was collected during this aerial survey where we had over a billion acres with damage um, and mortality in our true fur species alone. And that's primarily attributed to drought and then subsequent fur and gray burr beetle damage. And then this is a different way to show you this data, but over a 10 year span. And so what we're looking at here is um, the uh, dotted line is how many acres we flew each year. We had one huge dip in 2020 due to COVID. Um, but what you're looking at is um, all of the damage that we're collecting from different abiotic agents. We do not capture everything. For example, diseases are really hard to capture through this survey. So a lot of what we're capturing is insect damage and underlying abiotic damage, such as drought. And then I also threw in the wildfire um, numbers. So you can see comparatively, all the red bars are wildfire. And then the purple, for example, are marked as bark beetle understanding that we have an underly underlying drought stress predisposing the trees to bark beetles. So you can see that most years bark beetle and drought is comparable to wildfire in terms of acres damaged by, um, damaged by these agents. So I'm, I'm really hammering a lot on drought because it's really setting the stage for insects and wildfire. Um, so just to kind of convey how, um, what it's doing on our landscape, how it's affecting trees specifically is that it kills fine roots or it collapses vascular tissues or those straws that are pulling the moisture from the roots and distributing it throughout the tree. The tree then responds to that loss of drought by dropping leaves that can reduce photosynthesis um, sometimes they will close the holes in their leaves that are releasing moisture into the atmosphere during photosynthesis. So that means they're retaining more moisture by closing those holes, but then they're stopping photosynthesis. So they're retaining moisture, but then they're starving. There's only so long that they can do that for. And then defenses are hampered because there is a um, reduction in that moisture that goes to support growth. And therefore there's even less leftover for defense. And so the typical symptoms you'll see in trees from drought stress are a thinning canopy, flagging or a little bit top kill um, or individual branches that have died. Sometimes individual branches will drop off in an asymmetrical fashion. And so you'll have kind of a wonky looking tree versus things like bark beetles in which the whole tree turns red within the span of a year. It's less of a slow burn. Drought can kill trees years after um, the initiation. And even when punctuated by a year or two of good moisture, trees don't just bounce right back because they can't simply repair those tissues. They typically have to rebuild them so they can die years later from drought stress. All right, let's get back to insects. Um, so the primary insects that we're worrying about that are killing trees, and remember opportunistically when the trees are stressed are bark beetles. Even though they're very small, they're about the size of a matchstick head um, or a grain of rice. They are opportunistic and their populations can erupt en masse. So what they do is they can smell that this is a tree species that they wanna feed on. Some are specific as, for example, Doug fir bark beetle likes only Doug fir and specifically large diameter Doug fir. They can smell that it's Doug fir. They get in and they go, okay, this has enough sapwood. This is the moisture content that I want. I'm going to send out a signal um, to others in my species to attract them to this tree, both because I want mates and I want help overcoming the defenses of the tree. Then once they reach a critical mass where they don't want to overwhelm their resources, they send a repellent pheromone saying no vacancy. And so they're very effective in this way to be able to get the food that they need and not overuse their resources. What they do is they don't go into the wood, they just go under the bark and etch the sapwood and the cambium, and they're creating these feeding galleries that girdle the tree. They also introduce fungus that's non-rotting, but it clogs those vascular tissues, also hastening the death of the tree. So they're very effective in this way at killing trees when their populations get high. Um, exterior symptoms that you may see when bark beetles attack a tree, if it has enough moisture to produce pitch, it will once the beetles enter. So you might see droplets or streams or pitch tubes if it's pine. And you can see in that center top image, that's a little bark beetle that's stuck in the pitch because it is, as I mentioned, a chemical um, repellent, but it's also a mechanical barrier. So it drowns them or, or prevents them from invading the tree. When trees don't have enough moisture, you may not see these exterior symptoms of um, pitch because 
they don't have enough pitch to produce. And so the insects do what's called a blind attack. They can enter the tree and you don't see any pitch on the exterior. Because these insects only enter the bark and not the wood, the thrass or the boring dust sawdust that they kick out is going to be brown. So that's a key feature. If you see a whole bunch of little uh, piles of brown sawdust in the bark, you've got a bark beetle issue. If you look a little closer, um, you may see um, galleries. So you have to peel back the bark to see those galleries. Sometimes they're etched on the interior of the bark, but also the sapwood. You may see the insect itself. Remember, it's very small. They're brown or blackish, um, about the size of a grain of rice. Their larvae are about the size of a grain of rice as well. And then once they leave the tree, they've used up the resources that they want. Um, they will leave exit holes, and they're perfectly round. And typically, there's a whole bunch clustered in one area. Um, they will typically um, come in, kill a tree within one year and leave, and they do not come back to that tree. So that dead tree is not a reservoir for bark beetles. Uh, wood boring beetles will get in to break down that material, but bark beetles will not keep hitting that tree because that tree, has, uh, the resources have been used and they don't like a tree that's starting to decompose. You may also see staining or particularly in central Oregon, in pine, you'll see woodpecker flecking um, a lot of times on ponderosa pine where the woodpeckers can hear the beetles inside and will shave off the bark in search of grubs. And then the tree will turn fully red or the top third turns red and then the rest of it turns red within the same year. And this will happen very quickly after insect attack. So once you start seeing these symptoms in the trees, step out to the next green adjacent tree, that's likely the currently infested tree. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the specific pests to worry about. We have a lot of information um, on our website about these where you can learn about the specifics of each one and how to manage for them, but it's really managing for those predisposing factors or the tree's drought stress, for example. Um, but these are the main ones to worry about and the main scenarios to worry about. Um, so anywhere you have dug fur, if it's large diameter, be thinking about dug fur beetle. There is a repellent pheromone that's very effective for this and only this insect um, primary, pretty much that is actually effective. And it can be applied before they start flying to push them out of an area. So if you have large diameter dug fur that are damaged from wildfire or drought stress, um, I would look into MCH repellent to apply at least in the, um, before the first spring after that event. And we have more, more information about that on our website, but I will provide a copy of this PDF so that you can um, have on hand what major beetle species to worry about. Um, and then the link that I have later on in this document on, as to where to access that. A little note about wood boring beetles. So oftentimes a tree will be killed by the bark beetle and then the wood boring beetles come in and they break down the rest of that material. Wood borers um, are decomposers primarily and they get into the wood. They don't girdle the tree. So typically they're not tree killers. We do have a few exceptions that I'll go into. Um, but these beetles are typically pretty large. They leave large boring um, or exit holes. Um, some are a little bit smaller, but you'll see that hole continue into the wood versus um, bark beetles. They do not, those holes do not get into the wood. They just etch on the outside of it. And then um, an exterior symptom um, of wood bore activity is white frass. Because they get into the wood, they kick out that white frass. And so they are not agents of um, mortality for trees, but they can cause defects by just riddling the wood with holes. So a key wood boring pest is flathead fur borer. It's found in dug fur. Typically it attacks dug fur that are on super droughty strides, sites. Those trees are really stressed. They're along edges, sun exposed areas, uh, rocky areas, um, or they've been damaged by wildfire. So um, flathead fur borer can be a major wood boring uh, pest because instead of going all the way in the wood, like the rest of wood borers, it only etches underneath the bark like a bark beetle. Similar to that is emerald ash borer. You may have heard about this new invasive insect to Oregon. Um, so it works very similar to flat-headed fur borer, very similar to bark beetles, even though it's a wood borer. Um, and this insect is from Asia, was just found in Oregon. It's been in other states on the east, but it has just been found in Oregon. Um, and so we're very concerned because it kills ash trees. Um, and pretty much all the ash trees on our landscape are going to be susceptible to this insect. So um, I can provide you more information um, 
through our Forest Health website. We have a lot of info about emerald ash borer. Currently, it's only in Forest Grove. We haven't found it elsewhere, but we are asking for folks to report what they see. If you see some ash that looks stressed, it's got top kill or thinning, take a closer look. Does it have D-shaped exit holes? Um, like you can see in the picture, they're about the size of a pencil eraser if you just cut it in half. Um, then we want to know about it. Please report it to this link. Now, there are some defoliator pests on the east side um, to worry about. However, they typically have periodic outbreaks that collapse on their own. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. But when you have a defoliator outbreak in an area, that is stress the tree. Even though it hasn't killed it, it can then predispose it to bark beetle. Um, because it is a previous stressor. So a lot of times what you'll see is trees are already drought stressed, then they get hit by defoliators, then they get hit by bark beetles, and they just can't fight all of those things at once. Here's a few more, the balsam woolly adelgid and black pine leaf scale. Um, those also can defoliate the tree by just sucking out the juices and then the um, leaves will drop to the ground. And I just want to mention a few common non-pest scenarios that you see uh, very often in Central Oregon. So um, large pitch tubes with this grape nuts looking material frass um, below them. Um, that's usually an indicator that your tree is already being damaged by something else. And usually you can see that it's been uh, heavily damaged by fire, for example. That is a type of bark beetle, but it cannot kill trees. So if you see a whole bunch of very large pitch tubes and that grape nuts frass at the bottom of the tree, know that that tree um, is being stressed by something else, but typically you can see other symptoms in the tree as well. And then large pitch masses, uh, masses from sequoia pitch moss, and I'm large as in about palm size. Sometimes you'll see trees that look like candles, they're dripping so much pitch. It's actually a good thing trees are producing pitch, that means they have enough moisture, um, but this insect does not kill trees. So it's really more of an aesthetic pest. And then there are defoliators that attack broad leaves each year, but they don't kill the buds. And so the tree will still flush out leaves the next year. So we typically don't worry about those pests. So I want to mention a few of the common insects that you'll see post fire. Um, if, you, if you've done any firefighting, some have maybe landed on you and bitten you. Um, um, very common insects are the firebug. So it's a type of beetle that can actually detect heat. They have organs on their body that can detect that heat and they can smell the volatiles from burning trees. So typically when a fire is burning, burning, you'll see a whole bunch of these very small insects flying around, landing on you, biting on you to see if you're the type of material they wanna feed on, um, but they do not kill the tree. They'll lay their eggs on those uh, damaged trees, but they will not kill the tree. And then um, the next one um, is a large wasp um, that I put in the, <laughs> what you commonly hear them called um, out working um, in the forest, um, because what they do is they drill into the wood and they lay eggs <coughs> in the dying trees. But the ones that we have in Oregon um, typically are not tree killers. So we do not concern ourselves with those. And despite their very large looking stinger, they cannot actually sting you. They'll try, um, but it really is it's not going to hurt. Despite the fact that they can drill into wood, they can't really puncture the skin on your hand. And then we have various wood borers. As I mentioned, wood borers like to get into material that's really stressed or already dying, and they burrow through and decompose that wood. And sometimes in a fire damaged area, you can hear the chomping of those insects in the trees. So what are the impacts of fire on insects, pest insects, for example? So fire weakens the tree and therefore it reduces the ability of that tree to resist or tolerate insect attack. When it's fire damage, it releases a new set of stress volatiles and increases ethanol. That's very attracted to those insects that keys them into knowing that this is a tree that they can attack. And it creates openings that are entry points for fungus. Fungus needs an opening to be able to attack. Um, and then that fungus can possibly weaken the trees further, predisposing them to insect attack. So following wildfire, um, just because you have a lot of insect attack doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have an outbreak. If that stand was pretty healthy before the wildfire, a lot of those trees will still pull through. So even though you see a lot of attack, it doesn't necessarily mean those trees are going to die if the defenses were healthy before the fire. 
Um, typically, you'll see a, an increase of attack rates um, the first year or two after a fire. Um, and so that's really where you want to look on the perimeter of that fire. Look at those green trees or trees that made it through the fire. Um, those are going to be the ones that are damaged enough to then be attacked by uh, subsequent insects. Um, insects further weaken the trees that are rebounding from the fire. So if they made it through the fire, then they get attacked by insects. It's the one to punch that can typically kill them. Um, and then just a few notes um, about post-fire, um, when you have a whole bunch of insect attack that creates things such as pitch tubes, the pitch tubes are pretty flammable. And so the fire can actually uh, climb up a tree in that way. So it's a little bit of a ladder fuel if you have a, a large amount. Um, also that first year, when, well, I'll discuss this more later, but that first year when you have those red needles, that's highly flammable. So if you have pitch tubes and then those red needles, that's a lot of ladder fuel. Um, and then once you have any sort of um, re um, reduced canopy from defoliating insects, for example, if you have shade intolerant flammable grasses, those can proliferate in the understory. So this is what I was mentioning when you have a fire scar and then in that perimeter around where that fire damage has taken place, where you see trees that are starting to fade, they, they still have some greenery, they have technically made it through the fire, um, even though they can die in a couple years after the fire from fire alone, um, looking at those trees and watching for those signs and symptoms, especially a bark beetle is gonna be really important. So the typical sequence would be you'll have fire and then you'll have bark beetles attack in that first year after or that first like springtime um, flight period um, after the wildfire. Um, if the wildfire happened early in the season, they can attack that same season, that summer, depending upon the species and what time they fly. After the bark beetles, you'll see in the first, sometimes the very end of the first year, full year of attack from bark beetle. Sometimes the second year, wood borers will come in um, and then they start the process of decomposition. So first you'll see that red frass from the bark beetle, then you'll see the white frass from the wood borers. And then if you actually look at the wood material, you'll see tunneling and holes and et cetera. And so if you are going to salvage that material, going in as quickly as possible is going to be your friend because then you're gonna prevent a, a high level of defect that can take place if you wait. So how to reduce insect risk. Um, before the fire, just maintain stand and tree vigor. Um, it's really essential to make sure that your trees are as healthy as possible to defend themselves from drought, from wildfire, from insects. Really targeting the resilience of the tree is um, the best. Um, it seems like the hardest route, but it is the less laborious and cheapest route rather than trying to treat an insect infestation after the fact. Oftentimes you can't. Um, there's nothing you can treat with and sanitation by removing infested trees is um, very difficult. And oftentimes you can't get ahead of the outbreak. Um, after you have a fire, assessing post-fire mortality, I'll talk more about that. So how damaged is this tree from the fire? Um, you can gauge like how likely it is to survive from um, post-fire, depending upon its level of damage, and then how likely is it to be attacked by insects. Um, salvaging living but highly damaged trees to prevent pest buildup in those trees is going to be useful. Um, getting ahead of that outbreak. And then while you're at it, removing other struggling trees or thin if necessary. Um, if you have the operators out there, you're already salvaging, remove some of those other trees that are struggling and competing with trees that should be left behind that are good trees and vigorous. If you have a pine stand, removing slash material to prevent its beetles. Its is a beetle that can develop very quickly within a couple months and they like fresh slash. So we do have a fact sheet about slash disposal, the timing on that. Um, but basically, if it's spring and summer, destroy that slash within a month or two, um, if possible, to prevent its beetles uh, outbreaking that material and destroy it as in burn it or chip it. Oftentimes, um, you run into fire season, you can't burn it, so you might only be able to chip it. You can also bury it, um, but usually that's more expensive. You can sanitize a site that's infested with beetles. However, that's not usually effective because it's really hard to stay ahead of a beetle um, outbreak unless you start at the very beginning of it. 
Um, you can create bark beetle breaks. So if you see an area that's heavily infested, you could create buffer cuts around it because it confuses them. When they fly out of that area, they don't go right to the next tree. They kind of wander around and distribute on the landscape and that can kind of contain some beetle um, areas. You can also trap the beetles. So if you have an area where you have a lot of fire damaged trees, you may let the beetle get in that first year and then harvest all that material and get it off site. And you've trapped and removed that material, but still have been able to salvage those logs. So this is the marking guide that I mentioned um, that helps you predict based on the level of bull char typically and proportion of crown scorch, whether or not that tree is going to make it through um, after wildfire damage. Um, there is a whole ranking based on tree species and size, and this is built on um, years and years of research in Oregon on kind of following trees at, with different levels of damage to determine how many made it with this percentage of um, the circumference that had bull char or this proportion of the crown that was scorched or incinerated. Um, how likely is it for that, that those trees survived? And so a ranking guide was put together to help guide, to kind of fix your eyes. A common rule of thumb across species, and this is only a very general rule of thumb, but if over 50% of their circumference, so looking around the quadrants of that bowl, over 50% of that bowl has deep charring, typically that, that's killed enough cambium in the tree that it will not survive from wildfire damage. Similarly, if there's 70% um, or more consumption of the needles or scorching of the needles, then that tree will not survive because it doesn't have enough needles to photosynthesize and to keep going year after year. So those kind of two rules of thumb, those are trees you want to get off the landscape. They're not going to make it and they're more, more likely to be attacked by bark beetles and to live on that site. There's a lot more information on the fact sheet that I have linked here. It's actually a shorter version of the Forest Service version. They have a 60 page fact sheet and then one that's a bit shorter, I think maybe 10 pages. Ours is three, so we really cut it down, but we do have links on ours to the Forest Service one should you want the full document. Um, so one thing you might be thinking of is now we know how wildfire affects insects, how does an insect outbreak affect um, or predispose trees to wildfire? So you would think that you have a whole bunch of insect killed trees, therefore your wildfire risk is heightened. That's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of um, mixed studies on that because it really varies by the relationship. So for example, if you have pine, um, pine typically when they die, they drop their needles pretty quickly. And so that first year after the, the trees have um, been killed by bark beetles, you have those red needles hanging onto the trees. That is the highest level of fire risk for those trees. But then the second year when they drop those needles, then the risk is much lower for the trees themselves. Even though it contributes to ground fuels, um, there isn't as much ladder fuel because those needles have been dropped. However, if you have a situation where it's a true fir stand, true fir hangs on to needles, dry needles for much longer. And so you could have a multiple year wildfire risk there. Um, but typically, once those needles drop, the wildfire risk for the trees um, goes way down. So um, finishing up here, I have a few more little side notes about um, some of the benefits of fire for some of our other insects. Um, so what we found in Oregon through recent research is that whenever we have um, an event that um, shifts the stand back to an early seral stage, so it's wildfire or intensive logging where you've removed a lot of that canopy, there's been a huge influx the immediate year after in um, increased wild bee abundance and diversity. We have over 600 species of wild native bees in Oregon. It's not just honeybees and bumblebees out there. We have our wild native bees because honeybees are not native. Um, these other bees are pollinating a bunch of other things that we have out in terms of our natural wild or um, wild flower, wildflowers and uh, flowering shrubs, but also our agricultural products that we really need these bees for. And so what that fire or intensive logging is doing, opening up that canopy, 
is it leaves the ground exposed with exposed soil for ground nests. Many of these bees are ground nesting, but they don't like to dig, so they want exposed soil. It also leaves behind woody debris for nests that stumps, um, anything with like uh, holes already drilled into it from beetles, for example, these bees will utilize that for their nests. Um, and sometimes they will chew their own holes. So having that debris left behind is useful. And then because you have that open canopy, there's more sunlight that germinates any of the flowering plants in the under that were in the understory. Um, and it also increases the thermal conditions. So basically makes the soil warmer for ground nests. Um, so that's been a, a direct one-to-one -one relationship that's been found that um, wildfire is very beneficial for bees. Um, I, and I do want to mention that uh, we, <laughs> bees are not just about the wasps that are on our landscape. So typically, when I say we want bees in our forested systems, um, we also want wasps as well. They're predators. Um, they're great for control. But um, when you see these big paper nests, that is not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about wild bees. I'm talking about these um, other little things that aren't as stingy. Um, so I'll finish up here with some links to, um, basically, this is a link to our main forest health page. We have a lot of fact sheets on there, um, some informational videos on how to uh, diagnose if you have bark beetle, for example. Um, they're really nice and short, hopefully easy to consume. We also have all of our survey data. So um, this is a 70-year data set that we've been surveying for over 70 years. And so you can see the maps, the raw data, our annual forest health report, where we talk about what we saw in the past year. Um, so really helpful information. If you have questions about our aerial survey data, please do contact me or um, other members of our forest health team. We all contribute to it. There are some caveats when you look at that data that it looks like, wow, that's a whole lot of bark beetle damage, but you need to understand the narrative underlying that in that you have drought stress predisposing those trees and then the beetles will finish it off. So with that, um, I threw a lot of information at you and I wanna leave time for questions. So I'll just end it there and uh, let me know if you want me to go through the chat first or um, hand raising. Um, yeah, I think there was a couple questions that popped up in the chat if you wanna start there and then we'll. Okay, sure. I can, um, I'll read through those. Let me get to the start of the questions here. Um, I don't know if the um, W9 and 3 question agreement was oh. for me. <laughs> no, that, that was for me. I think the next okay. one. Are we okay, great. Um, are we anticipating large kill-offs from bark beetles in overstocked lodgepole stands? Absolutely. So mountain pine beetle is the primary beetle that is attacking lodgepole. You also have some ifs in the smaller um, diameter material. But when you see these sweeping of uh, these pictures um, of multiple states in the West of um, large patches of red trees, most often that's mountain pine beetle and it kills any sort of pine, but it really tends to go after the lodgepole that we have because it is often overstocked. We have these dog hair thickets out competing each other for moisture. Um, so anytime we see an overstocked lodgepole stand, you can um, bet, especially during drought periods, we are going to have upticks in mountain pine beetle and its beetles that go after those trees. And so the more we can do getting ahead of it by thinning, um, or species, uh, increasing a species mixture. So it's not just these open areas that are perfect for lodgepole to establish. Maybe they're a bit more shaded. Um, that can be useful to prevent that. Can MCH be used on other trees, not just Douglas fir? So MCH is only useful for Douglas fir beetle, which only gets into Douglas fir. So if you have a stand that's Douglas fir and you wanna protect it from Doug fir beetle, you'd wanna apply MCH. If you have a mixture of Douglas fir and other trees, when you're laying out this grid of MCH, you'll staple them um, about every 30 feet. You can staple them to any species of tree because you're creating a cloud over the whole area rather than an individual tree protection. 
um, even though it can be used for individual tree protection. So, um, but it's not protecting that other species from other bark beetles that are getting into it. That one slide that I had of the major bark beetles, those are pretty much all you need to worry about. Um, we don't really have a lot of tree killing beetles in our other species of trees. Um, so you just want to look at that list. Um, but MCH is only for Douglas fir and remember, and only for Douglas fir beetle. And remember, that beetle only gets into Douglas fir and larger diameter specifically, so over 10 inches dBH. Um, there are other formulations for other beetles. Um, one main one is verbenone, um, but that is only to be used for lodge, pure lodgepole sand for mountain pine beetle and only when mountain pine beetle has a large outbreak. And even then, it's not even close to 100%. MCH has been proved to be very effective for Doug fir. Verbenone is really spotty. You also see online various statements about verbenone preventing other types of bark beetles in pine, but it's only for mountain pine beetle. And I usually tell people don't waste your time and money on verbenone, only use MCH for Doug fir stands. If you have other types of tree hosts, that you do not have a repellent at your fingertips. Could you put the distance between that should be maintained to prevent beetle communication from tree to tree or stem to stem? That's a difficult one um, because it really varies by how trapped the smells of the tree are getting in that stand. So if you open up the stand, you increase airflow. And so it's not such a concentrated smell. It also visually to the beetles, they like to see a whole bunch of um, uh, basically dark columns. And so if there's a more space stand, they're not seeing all the food sources. They can't recognize that this is a forested area. It just looks like maybe there's a tree here and a tree here. Um, additionally, when you space out those trees, they have more access to moisture, that they don't have as much competition for it. But you really want to focus on what should the stocking of the stand be based on the site index, um, the size of the trees, the next time you can possibly thin or when you're going to harvest. And so for that, you would want to work with a stewardship forester from OSU or from ODF to specifically look at the conditions of your stand. You want to um, increase that spacing based on what those trees need. Whatever you do to serve those trees is going to prevent beetle outbreaks. Um, but if you're talking about buffer cuts for beetles, that can be very variable, um, but typically it has to be a pretty wide buffer cut. So I would say at least uh, 60 feet. Um, but there's a lot of a wide buffer cut should be, um, but any sort of buffer is going to kind of breaking the continuity of that forest and therefore the ability for that beetle to travel from tree to tree because they usually don't like to travel very far. They have limited fat stores when they wake up and go to attack a tree um, and then they don't have to fly. To all right, so that's all the questions in the chat. Um, do we have time for any other questions? Yeah, it looks like Ariel has her hand up. Ariel, you want to go ahead? Great, thank you. Uh, Christine, good to see you. Uh, thanks for presenting. That was great. Um, I have two questions, if there's time for it. Um, yeah. The first one is, uh, what can, can you speak to, um, you spoke about wildfire impacts on tree stress and that increasing susceptibility to insects, um, but what about um, how historic fires were or prescribed fire um, how that could potentially decrease susceptibility or increase resilience, um, you know, in terms of darkness or, or if it's true about sap flow um, and immune responses. Yeah, so um, when you have historic fire, so let me, let me just state something that I think we all know here, that wildfire is a good thing if it's natural. Um, if we allow natural normal fire cycle to take place or we're utilizing prescribed fire. Those are very useful tools that we want to retain on the landscape. Not having enough wildfire allows encroachment of true fur in areas where it should not be, especially during climate change. Um, 
And it also allows things like lodgepole to proliferate um, into a really high stocking level. And so it stresses those trees. And so we need fire on the landscape. That is going to be essential for making these um, trees and stands healthier, more resilient, and therefore defended against insects. Um, for specifics about historic wildfire, if it's years and years past, um, the damage has been done. The trees that are going to make it have uh, rebounded within the next three to five years. So they are going to be um, pretty, pretty safe from bark beetles because past that three to five year <clears throat> range, um, beetles can still get in, but the, the majority of the trees that were pretty good just have a chirp and then in the meantime as those other trees around them have died there's been there's an increase in the moisture availability so the remaining trees are doing very well so hopefully um that answered your question um i think i got all of it <laughs> yeah yeah thank you um and then the, the other question was so when you guys do the aerial surveys um how do you distinguish between the trees the tree species um, is there a trick for example distinguishing between ponderous pine and juniper and like an ortho imagery yeah or... <laughs> yeah that's a, <laughs> a very specific that's question. a great question and that's one of the caveats i didn't go into about the aerial survey data and that's why i stress if you are going to utilize that data reach out to us with questions or just learning a, a little bit more about it reading our forest health highlights, we really go into detail about what the survey data means and what it does not mean. So typically, um, I'll cover two things. So in terms of the volume of damage, so we always say acres with damage or mortality, not of, because it's a mosaic. Now we try, try to draw our polygons very tight and just draw the, um, the area that's really impacted, but there are some live trees within that polygon. So um, when we quote our numbers in terms of um, how many acres with damage we have, it's because it's kind of buffering with, there's probably a few less acres than that of damage just because it's the most big of healthy and dead trees. With that being said, we also miss a lot um, when we're flying survey. And so it kind of evens out because we do miss some of the dead trees on the landscape. We're flying really low really fast. Sometimes we're a little tired or nauseous. It's a, it's a very intense video game we're playing, looking out the window and, and drawing everything we see. Um, so we do miss some things out there as well. Um, we miss the exact placement of it. So it might be maybe the next draw over or a quarter of an acre over. Um, so it, it's um, getting, how do we identify what's what? So we do have ground knowledge of what insects are active or what abiotic factors are active or diseases on the landscape below us because we do a lot of field work. Um, but when we're up in the air, we typically will note, oh, that's a dug fir. Um, it's of this size. It's likely going to be dug fir beetle, knowing there's some underlying stressors such as drought. And so we kind of have the ground knowledge to fill in what the agent is for the host species. Um, there are a lot of differences in color and shape and, and the, the way they change color when they're killed. So for example, um, if we're looking at a dug fir, it looks um, kind of rounded uh, on the top. There's a little bit of pointing, but not as much as a true fir. A true fir top looks more pointed. The coloration looks more bluish, um, like a bluish green in the trees. Fur, it looks a bit orangey red versus true fur, it looks brick red. Uh, if you have lodgepole, they look really skinny and they have a brick red color. So it's knowing, well, we're flying over central Oregon. So typically we're gonna see some pond, uh, mostly ponderosa, some dug fur, a little bit of true fur here and there, a little bit um, of you know this or that species. So we know by ground knowledge of what's present there, but also, the color, the shape of the tree, um, and then um, a little bit of background knowledge of what attacks that tree typically. Um, but it can be hard. There are some times that surveyors are speaking to each other in the plane and one goes, all right, I'm seeing a lot of ponderosa over here. And the one on the other side of the plane goes, really? I thought it looked like Doug Fur. So um, we, do, um, we do have some caveats with our data collection, but 
when taken at the larger landscape um, or watershed level scale over multiple years, it's really a course overview. Um, communicates us when we see um, large changes on the landscape. Um, okay, and then a uh, question in the chat, do you have any tips for how to promote natural predators of pathogenic insects? Um, so allowing some habitat, so not sterilizing the underscore, understory in particular. So now weigh this with, um, you need to be protecting um, trees against wildfire risk, et cetera, and they need enough moisture. Um, so don't allow things to outcompete them in the understory, but allowing some patches of natural native understory is useful for habitat because a lot of these insects are like little flies and wasps. They're really small and they're kind of sleeping and hibernating and creating young in the understory underneath um, different understory plants. And so having allowing the natural landscape to be natural in those areas is really useful. Um, when applying insecticides or even herbicides, just thinking about the non-target impact. So if you're applying herbicides everywhere, you're cutting out all that understory. You're also reducing habitat for those natural enemies that are residing in that understory. But when you're treating with insecticides, being wary of the timing of the treatment, how broad spectrum it is. So there is a preventative barrier treatment to um, trees that you can spray the exterior of the tree um, from top to bottom till runoff wet to prevent bark beetle entry. However, this is a broad spectrum insecticide that kills anything that's landing on that tree. So um, that's something that you really have to weigh. First, it's gonna be really expensive and second, um, is the benefit of protecting those trees from bark beetle going to be uh, outweighing any sort of long-term impact that you are also killing natural enemies, at least for um, the next couple of years that come to land on this tree? So you have to be really judicious in its use. So um, I would say increasing habitat um, and really being careful with using insecticides and herbicides are the best ways to promote natural predators. Um, and then uh, what's predicted for the next Pandora moth outbreak? So Pandora moth is a squirrely one. Its biology is not, um, we have some defoliators that will outbreak every five to 10 years, kind of like clockwork. Pandora moth is all over the place. It could be each, every 10 years. There have been gaps um, of 150 years between outbreaks. Um, Typically when you have an, a Pandora moth outbreak though, it will continue on for six to eight years. So it can last for a long time, but it may not reoccur for quite a long time. What you guys have been experiencing in Central Oregon recently is that the Pandora moth outbreak went on a little bit longer, mainly because you had sick population. So some were an outbreak year six, and then others were an outbreak year eight and were collapsing. And so you see a little bit of staggering. So we really don't know uh, where they'll strike next, how heavily they'll strike next, um, but we do have a little bit of kind of some hangers on from that last outbreak. However, they're dwindling across the entire area. And you're always gonna see some pandora they don't fully go away. All right, any other questions? Do we have questions in the room? Any questions in the room? Uh, this may not apply to uh, natural forests in Oregon, but for urban forests, we're uh, in our subdivision. We have a lot of aspen trees that are dying from the American. Um, did I hear um, what was the you mentioned? The American hornet moth is attacking our aspen trees. I'm not familiar with familiar with the American hornet moth. Did I hear that right? Yes, uh huh. Okay. Um. Well, you might be thinking of satin moth. Um. I'm not sure. Aspen have been under risk. Um. In all the western states, actually, for quite some time. There's um. There's a kind of a sudden death. Um. Uh. Issue that's been going on that hasn't really been pinpointed as to what's really causing it. Some of it's drought stress. Um, there are a wide variety of foliar diseases and insects that attack aspen. Um, 
that a lot of populations have been stressed from those. Um, but we do have satin moth, specifically in Central Oregon, which is an invasive that's been long established. But because aspen is um, a broadleaf tree that loses its leaves every year, typically it doesn't kill the tree, it just defoliates it, and then the next year it will bounce back. But if you've had trees that are actually being killed by that defoliator, um, it would be interesting to know more about that. And I have not heard about this insect that you're mentioning. Um, Apparently it's from the East Coast and it's migrated into work. It girdles the tree when they, first of all, lays eggs in the, um, the so we've had we've had about tree. ten cases just in our one subdivision. Okay, so there are no moth girdling that we have present in Oregon. Could it possibly be that this is a beetle? Well, no, my my forest or my. Um, my tree guy said it is the American hornet moth, and when I googled American hornet moth, it was all there. That, and you can specifically see around the bottom of the aspen, right close to the soil line, a whole bunch of little BB size holes, and uh, then they, the tree falls over. We had fall, okay. one fall over on a pickup truck at a corner. So. Yeah, I would be really interested to see more about that um, because that is not something that I've heard of. So I'll, I'll look that up. But if you have images you can send me, I'm more than happy to do a little bit more research on it and send my response to the group. Um, one thing I might be thinking of is there's a lantern moth in the east that, uh, okay, here's a link right here. Um, that we have not yet found in Oregon, but we are a lookout for. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so this this moth that you're showing a picture of. Um, so there, I did show you an image of. Let's see here. Let me get to the right slide. Oh, darn it! I'm not sure what I did just there. Hold on one second. Well, I'll show you the image that right here. Um, so this is actually a moth. Um, they can burrow, but they do not typically kill the tree. And let me show you what we typically will see. That's the one. <laughs> typically in pine, we have, this is native in Oregon. Um, this central picture, I don't know if you can see my mouse circling, but that central picture, that is, uh, that's um, sequoia pitch moth, which is native, and it does create little wounds in the tree, but it cannot kill the tree. It doesn't really go deeply enough, um, and it doesn't really girdle the tree in a large area, despite how bad this large tree looks. Um, it's just a little portion of real estate that it takes up um, per uh, section of the tree. If the tree is very small diameter, then it can kill the tree. Um, but typically this is what we're seeing on our landscape and it's on conifers. I am not familiar with this moth in President Oregon. Uh, we work closely with Oregon Department of Agriculture that monitors all invasives that are coming into the state. And this is not one on our lookout list. So I would be interested to know more about what you're seeing specifically at your site. Because if this is present, Oregon Department of Agriculture and Oregon Department of Forestry would definitely want to know about it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to put my email in the chat. If you wouldn't mind connecting outside of this and we can look more into it, um, that would be really helpful. I'll share, for those in the room, I'll share all these links when I do the meeting minutes next week. So Great. Thank you, thanks. Yeah. Um, any other questions in the room? Questions on chat or online? <laughs> Okay. Well, 
yeah, thank you, Christine. I really appreciate that. That was a great uh, presentation. Um, a lot of good information for a lot of our neighborhoods and communities around here that they can look for when they're doing some of their field treatments. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, I put my email in the chat and I will send um, this PowerPoint so that you have all the links, but please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or the rest of the Forest Health Unit. Um, we are here at your disposal for any sort of diagnosing and management guidance, um, even sending us pictures. Sometimes we can just troubleshoot it that way or we do site visits. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. Really appreciate having you. And like Kim said, that was an awesome presentation. Um, yeah, please send me your PowerPoint so I can share it with uh, the whole the whole uh, mailing list. <laughs> Will do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we just got a little bit more time here. Usually we kind of leave the end for a roundtable discussion. Um, I think we'll just go around the room here. We don't so we'll probably just do everyone here in the room and uh, we'll probably focus on more committee members online. So if we could start over here, just give us just a general update. Oh, um, so I am with Discovery Your Forest. We are a nonprofit partner of the Deschutes and Ojico National Forest, and I'm the wildland for uh, wildland fire uh, education coordinator. Um, uh, we are in partnership with the Forest Service, are planning an event, um, a film screening called The West is Burning, um, along with a panel discussion with a variety of professionals, uh, fire and forest uh, ecologists. Um, that will be April 20th at 630 at the Sisters of the House. But that is kind of really uh, capacity. If it's not the spring, once again, my name is Dan. Consulting, and so what we haven't visited. And the only thing I have is the fact that though, I'll be using up the county grant in June. It'll be for the dumpsters and three we'll have three dumpsters throughout the you should through with right. for fire fuels. That's it. Uh, good morning, Patty Gentilomos. I'm member owners association. Uh, Spring is trying in South County. Um, we're still finishing up our 2022 acreage uh, that we kind of got shut out with the weather and then going to bid for 2023. Hopefully we'll get another 150 acres this year. Um, and we do, it was a great presentation. Thank you so much because we do get background IPS in our community as well as some uh, Western pine beetle. It's been kind of bouncing around a little bit uh, not a lot, um, and we haven't seen mountain pine beetle for um, a couple of years now. So uh, it's just uh, interesting to see the cycle um, first, but not too much to report, but it's going to be a busy summer. That's for sure for us. Thank you. With Three Pines Angel, currently working on some uh, projects uh, doing the dumpster program again this spring uh, to encourage residents to clear debris. Um, we'll be hosting a couple of educational seminars as well um, in, um, in collaboration with a neighboring community as well as um, then in June, we'll be focusing on fire extinguisher use um, and evacuation tips. 
Um, again, a man homes from uh, the bridges and the, one of the resident um, firewise leaders. We're working on a um, wildfire preparedness day event, which we are going to do on Saturday, May 6th. And in the morning, we're going to um, clear around our common buildings where the bark mulch is up against the building and, and get that back and install rock in there. Um, and then in the afternoon, um, we're having some activities for kids and educational activity and then a free barbecue for our community. Uh, Bob Poley again with uh, Mountain High HOA, and we are also gearing up for the fire free events. We're having a 30 cubic yard uh, roll off dumpster place for uh, two weeks in a central location. We're having a curbside pickup of yard debris and uh, vegetation for our residents who are uh, either elderly and can't get to the dump or to the uh, to the uh, roll-off dumpster, and we're also celebrating the uh, National Firewise uh, Defensible Space Day on May 6th with a barbecue and uh, talking about defensible space. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to mention is one of our residents has Safeco insurance and brought to my attention a letter they got from Safeco that states that uh, he qualifies for one of their benefits called wild, wildfire response benefits at no extra cost. And um, the actions that they will take uh, if a wildfire is noted in the area is they will remove pine needles and leaves from gutters, remove flammable vegetation items from around their house. They will apply a water-based gel or firefighting foam to the home. They could be deploying a temporary sprinkler system to the home. And if the person's evacuated, the action is taken to their property. And then after the fire, they return any needle items moved and they wash any fire gel or firefighting foam away uh, from the uh, wildfire event. So uh, this is a free um, benefit apparently of Safeco. And interestingly enough, two of my wild uh, project, excuse me, two of my FireWise members <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the question, it brings a lot of things to, to mind, like, okay, how, how do they pick, if there is a work, I mean, how do they pick to, to get these benefits and things like that, but anyway, I just thought it's interesting, if you want to check it out, you can go to the Safeco insurance website, and they have a whole packet on it. What did they call it again? They call it offering a wildfire, uh, it's called the wildfire response benefit, okay. so... I wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah. Dave Brinker, uh, Elkai Woods Townhomes, and uh, I'm new to Firewise. Our community did get certified last year, and so we're uh, continuing to go down the path like others. I'm working on uh, our plans for the spring. And I'm Mary Ann Kramer, and Dave and I live in the same community, so we, we share duties with firewise. Carolyn Dolbert. May 6th, they're doing the same other other HOAs are too. So getting prepared for that. Looking to set out flyers to get involved. Uh, this for time has been documenting controls kind of everything to do with development throughout all of the unincorporated areas of the county. So we were not in the city of Ben Sisters uh, red number of the fine. It's going to be adopted as a part of that document. It deals with a lot of things, including natural hazards. We're in our second round of open houses. Um, that's going to be in some more scattered communities, places in the South County, places in the eastern portion of the county. Meetings go to Deschutes 2040. Now, if you type that into Google, it'll take you directly to the website. There's a listserv you can sign up for to receive up when those things actually get released. Okay, let's see. Um, anyone online? Uh,
private quads and then also at the church. So um, I, was, I was actually surprised. Yeah. Within three nights, we uh, I created a signs and put them on all four sides of the dumpsters um citing what were listing the, the acceptable materials and then listing what was not acceptable and it was all itemized i have to send it to you and then we also had monitors um uh, assigned so anyone who you know I, I picked a certain person to a responsible person yeah, yeah. to check the dumpster every day for the yeah. material that was what I did, I, I would every day see if it was full. So after after three days, it was full. So I had to wait another four to work and pick it up and put it in the stuff. So that's what I was checking every day, also. I want to say ours is close enough to our maintenance building that there's a security camera, too, that can uh, kind of see. That's For our, our dumpster program, you know, we usually try and have a couple of people on site to kind of look at those loads before they go into the dumpsters. Maybe ours is too accessible, but it's like the only place yeah. we have. Like we just have a ton of problems. Getting stuff we don't want to <laughs> Okay, uh, any more questions? Uh, yeah, can we hear you online? Here we can. Hopefully, you can hear hear me. Yes. Uh, this is Ari Cowan, OSU Extension. Um, I hit the chat early, but there's a fly and a link I posted. Um, there's uh, now we have entered the 21st century, and we have a Google Forms. And fill out online or on their phone um, if they are interested in the wildfire home protection strategies course or workshop that um, Heather from OSFM and I have been offering along with Ben Fire and ODF. Um, so we have one of those classes is tomorrow at COCC. It's a very full class. We're excited about how much interest there's been. So if folks did not get into that class, then um, we hope you all can share that interest form um, and that'll help us determine where to have the next class. Um, but we do have some more that are being planned uh, in April. We have uh, one Juniper Canyon uh, and we have one Redmond uh, in Lapine and Warm Springs. So uh, please share that form, uh, greatly appreciate it. And then the last update is that we're excited um, that uh, we're going to get um, continuing education credits being offered with that workshop for landscapers. Uh, we just uh, were able to have a class for realtors where there were continuing education credits for realtors. And we're working on uh, looking into continuing education credits for um, building contractors. So. Uh, and, and possibly insurance agents. So that's just uh, you know another way that we're uh, outreaching, uh, trying to cater those workshops towards those groups and uh, help spread that information. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I'll share that form in our next newsletter as well. Thanks, Corinne. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Okay, uh, anyone else want to provide an update? Or I know a few folks put stuff in chat, so appreciate that. Yeah, this is Heather Miller from uh, Oregon State Fire Marshal's office. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I posted it in the chat, but just wanted to give people a heads up that uh, the Central Oregon Fire Prevention Cooperative is working on a series of public service announcements that uh, will be produced and aired in the Tri-County area and uh, really focusing on um, topics of landscape treatments, re resident mitigations, evacuation preparedness, um, safe debris burning practices, and safe uh, or fire safe recreation. And so uh, be on the lookout for those. And uh, we're excited to, to get that on board. Thank you. 
And then from the fire marshal's office standpoint, we are working on planning things for wildfire awareness month. And so um, there will be a series of webinars coming um, forth in the next few months. And so uh, we'll get those announcements as we get closer. And so that's all I have. Awesome. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, thank you, Heather. Okay, anyone else? And you can just uh, post it in chat if you um, like. Dean? Can you hear me? Just try. Oh, Dean, did you have a did you have an update? Well, well um, Dean, unless you had something here, I uh, really appreciate it. Um, again, reach out to us if there was something specific uh, we weren't able to cover in the meeting. Um, but appreciate it again. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for all those grant opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I can see it. 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 Yeah, I can see it.